Hi there, my name is Jill Weber and welcome to another episode of Laker Lessons brought to you by GVSU. Laker Lessons are virtual learning experiences that cover key topics in K-12 education. Today I'm joined by my colleague Wendy Miller and in this lesson we're going to introduce the second of three English code complexities. Teachers need to utilize all three code complexities for effective literacy instruction. Let's talk about the objectives of this webinar. The first objective is recognize the role of code development. Recognize and apply the concept of same sound, different spelling, and how to teach this code complexity in a one-on-one, -on -one, small group, or whole group session. We're going to talk about research, learning and demonstration. So if you've watched past Laker lessons of ours, that's the same format that we have followed. And I'm going to talk about the essential instructional practices. These are instructional practices that need to be happening in classrooms every single day. They are research-based. They Studies have showed that they will make an impact on literacy development. Uh, and you can find more information about these essential instructional practices at literacyessentials.org. The next research I'm going to reference is Scarborough's Reading Rope. This is a great representation of how we all learn how to read. So we have the language comprehension strand and then we have the word recognition strand. So within that rope there are several different components that make up the language comprehension, the word recognition. So we're going to spend time in the word recognition today in decoding. So we're going to be talking about the sound letter relationship and its importance and how we become skilled readers. So every strand in this rope is equally important, but today we're going to be talking about that decoding strand. Next, Wendy's going to talk to you about systematic and explicit instruction. Yes, I want to make sure before we move forward that we all have a common definition of systematic and explicit because these are two terms you're going to want to make sure that you keep at the forefront of your work when you look at your phonics programs and you're kind of looking at the scope and sequence and how your instruction is, is laid out throughout the year. Let's look at this term systematic and let's come up with a common definition for this. So really the term systematic just means your program is based on a method or a plan. You have some sort of defined scope and sequence and that sequence makes sense for your students. The other word is explicit. We need to make sure that the phonics is being taught in a clear and direct way. So when examining your phonics program and, and the first place you should start is making sure that you have a systematic and explicit program and manner in which you are um, providing instruction for students. Next, we want to get into the learning itself and what do we mean by code complexity? So code complexity, we really just mean phonics, right? Um, how are you working with those sounds? How are you helping the students recognize the letters and associate the sounds with those letters and then actually be able to read? That's kind of what we mean by code complexity. And the other area of that has to do with we have a com complex language. And so within, within the language, there's, there's some things that your students need, need to understand. And Jill and I have been in this space for a really long time, and there's three of them that we have interwoven into all of the work um, we've done over the 10 years. And this code complexity we're focusing on today is you can have one sound, and it can be spelled multiple ways. Let's talk about what in the world does that mean? And then I'm going to go into an example and why this is important. But what do I mean by you can have one sound and it's spelled multiple ways? Well, we have a beautiful language. And it would just be so much easier if when the kids were in kindergarten, we introduced the letters to them and we, we, they saw that letter A and they knew there was one sound and there was one sound only that was associated with that A. Unfortunately, our English language just doesn't work that way. And, and not only do, do we have different sounds that you say for an individual letter, but when we start putting our letters together, there's all kinds of different sounds that come up um, when we start putting letters together. So they really need to understand that in our English language, you can have one sound, but not only is there more than one letter that goes together to spell that sound, but you can also spell it in multiple ways so that when they go to read, they're going to hear that A sound and they're going to look visually and it's going to be spelled differently. Let me show you an example of what this looks like. Let's look at this word peel. You can see in the middle that E spelling in peel has the double E. But when we move on to the word meat, it actually changes. And that E spelling in meat is spelled differently. It's spelled with the E-A. 
And then we can actually show them another word where there's another E spelling, like in happiness, but now we've switched to a one letter spelling for E, which is that I. And then if we look at another word, like in the word sunny, they're encountering that E sound again, another one letter spelling, but we're not even keeping it the same, like in happiness, we're switching it up on them and we're using a different code or a different letter for that spelling E. So this is why it's so important that students understand that there's more than one way to spell a sound um, in the English language. And why is this important? When they go to read sentences, they're gonna encounter this not only in different sentences throughout a passage, but they're gonna in see this multiple times within one sentence. Let me show you what this looks like. In this sentence, they took a 30 minute break at work eight days straight. Look at all the different words that are in that sentence that they're saying the A sound within those words, but they're all spelled differently throughout the sentence. So it's so important that kids understand this concept and that when you're looking at your phonics program, you need, and I'm gonna go back to those two words again, you need to make sure that there's a systematic and explicit way that you're teaching phonics that actually touches on this code complexity that you can have the same sound, but it's spelled in different ways. Another way to look at this is if you're looking at a sound chart and you can see here, this is a sound chart for the sound A. And in that sentence previously, I had all of these different spellings in it. So you can see here that there's actually five different ways that you can spell the A sound um, in the English language. And these actually aren't even all of the spellings here. We only put um, our top five in here. So Wendy, why don't you come on over and let's do sound boxes so we can demonstrate how we can teach this difficult skill of same sound, different spelling. Sure. So I'm going to be the teacher, you're going to be the student, okay. so I would expect you would make mistakes like a student would. I'm going to try and trick you. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Okay, our first word is fall. Fall. Okay. Tell me the sounds in fall. Fall. Good. So how many sounds are in fall? Three. Good. So go ahead and put a three at the top. So if this is a sound box, we're focusing on the sounds, so how many boxes are we going to fill in if there's three sounds in fall? Uh, one, two, th three. Good. So okay. we're going to fill in three boxes. So we're not focused on letters. There might be more letters in the word fall, but we're focusing on the sounds. So what's the first sound that you hear in fall? <sighs> Good. Go ahead and write what you think the f sound is in that first box. <sighs> Good. What's the next sound that you hear in fall? All. Okay. We're going to separate those sounds. So ah, oh. What's the sound you hear here? Aw. Oh. Good. We're going to write the, what you think the aw is. Uh. And I'm going to give you a hint. There's one letter uh. that spells aw. Oh, that's a good guess. So, aw. That's your aw. Go ahead and write that and say aw. So go ahead and erase uh. and write But that aw. says ah. Yeah, and it can say aw too. Uh. I know. Usually uh. when you hear the sound aw before an o, it's this letter. Okay. So, we're, I'm going to give you, so what's the next sound in fall? Oh. Good. There's two letters that spell that O oh sound. So go ahead and write. You have to write two letters in that box. All right. Good. You got it right. So go ahead and write. Say the sounds as you write. Fall on that bottom line. So. Ah. Oh. Good. Because that's how you're going to see that in text. Go ahead and erase. We're going to do one more word. The next word we're going to do is phone. Go ahead and tell me the sounds in phone. O. Oh. Mm. Good. So how many sounds in phone? Three. Good. So how many sound boxes are we going to fill in? Three. Good. So what's that first sound again in phone? <sighs> Good. That's the same sound as fall, right? Fall. Yes, same sound. Good. But in this word, this is spelled differently, the f sound. And I'm going to give you a hint. It's two letters that spell that f sound. So if, can you think of two letters that spell that f sound? Okay, that's a really good guess, but this is your f spelling in phone. So go ahead and erase and write that f. Good. And what's the next sound you hear in f? O. N. O. Good. Go ahead and write your O. O. Good. And what's the last sound you hear in phone? N. Good. There's two letters that spell N in phone. Mm. So write those two mm. letters. Very good. All right, go ahead and write phone on that line before you erase. Oh. 
O, mm. good. All right, so as you can see, using sound boxes really shows how the code is different, like we use those two words, fall and phone, have the same sound spelled differently. So that's a way you can use these. Um, you're also blending and segmenting, which are those foundational reading skills. How else would you use sound boxes, Wendy? When I was uh, working with the third grade class, um, what I did with them was I actually had the same thing that you said to me in the beginning. Um, it was a whole class. They had the sound boxes in front of them. I gave them the word phone. Um, I actually had them put a tile underneath that first box. If they had a tile underneath the box, it indicated them, instead of saying it to them out loud, it also showed them that there was more than one letter that went in a box. So I had them put a tile under the first box and the, last bo and the third box in the word phone so that it told them that more than one letter was going to go in a box. And as I was walking around the room, it was so interesting. I saw kids go to draw or write that letter F, and they saw the tile, and they would just where they were like, oh, I can't put that one letter there because she told me that more than one letter goes in a box. So these can be used in so many different ways. And um, even right there, we used it for spelling as well. But we're hoping that that, and we know, not hope, we know it carries over from the reading and the spelling doing it together. You're absolutely right. And that's such a great strategy then to indicate that there's more than one letter in the box yeah. so that they're not doing the F, they're writing yeah. two letters. Um, also connecting it with reading, so not just doing, often I feel like phonics is not connected to reading. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about that sound letter relationship as much as we should, connected to reading. So I think that's an important piece. And spelling. Mm -hmm. um, these, um, these sound boxes lend themselves to really bringing that reading and decoding aspect into spelling instead of rote memorization. For sure. All right, if you would like to see videos with students using sound boxes, we've included a link to the video in the description, along with tools like sound boxes to support the lesson you are viewing. Be sure to check out our videos on code complexity number one and three, this was two, if you want to view more Laker lessons or participate in other professional education opportunities to enhance your work, please visit gvsu.edu CSO and check out what is offered underneath the professional education tab.